Before I get on with today's video, I want to give a quick mention to Invert Shows UK and the very fast approaching Western Invert Show. Uh, this show will be on Sunday the 22nd of July at Thornberry Leisure Centre, which is in Bristol. Uh, it's £5 for adults, £2 for children, and doors open at 11, close at 4pm, so it's a 5 hours show. And of course at this show there will be loads of inverts for sale, different uh, livestock traders, there will be equipment for sale, and of course, one thing that inverse shows do that's different to any other show, they have actual animal shows there, so there's birds of prey, there's the uh, bug fest uh, show which is fantastic, I enjoyed that at the uh, Northern show. I of course will be there filming this show and if you are interested in coming along please uh, check out the information here to come along and also in the description, at the very top of the description there will be a link to their Facebook page. So please go and check them out and uh, hopefully I will see you at the Western show in July. Hello everyone, Trancha Dan here, I hope you're doing well today. So this video is going to be a little bit different, but one I hope some of you will enjoy and actually if you're from the surrounding areas, maybe in the future you will think about attending this in the future. So I'm on my way to the West Midlands Herpetological Society, which is held in Sutton Coldfield. I will put um, some information on screen for you guys to check out for, for where it is. This will be my second time attending uh, the society's meetings, and the meetings are once a month, uh, the first Sunday of every month, I believe, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, I will put a link in the description of this video, so if you'd like to check out the society and come along, have a few drinks with people, talk about uh, reptiles and, and stuff like that, then uh, yeah, I'll recommend you do so. I myself will be making this a regular thing. I do enjoy the people there. Um, a great bunch of people, really, really welcoming. And it's nice to talk to people that have similar interests, I guess. So, without ramming on too much, I think we should really go because it's now nearly half past five. It's a 40 minute drive to get there and it starts in half an hour, so I need to go. So uh, yeah, let's do this. Now, I will very, very briefly just go through some basics of hooking, okay? So, hopefully the guys, if you can't see them, we're just going to have to, well, yeah, talk to the in front of you about it, okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> this is going to show me up now, I know it's really going to be a problem. Um, snakes hate to be jabbed or that they don't like broken hook contact, so wherever possible, most snakes will cover will cover ground with their head slightly raised, okay? So, come out there. Never give them a pool table to Never play with. <laughs> okay, you can, see what, you can see what this tail section is doing now. So if we're using a hook, we always want to introduce it to the snake underneath the head, okay? Because the head is generally carried slightly off the floor. I'm not a fan of jabbing snakes. You're not going to get a good reaction um, from a snake by jabbing at its body. If you need to introduce a hook to a snake, do so from underneath the head, making sure that point is facing towards the sky, ensuring you've got good control of that animal. Okay? We don't want to be jabbing the snake at any one point. Now, even our boreal snakes, yes, they're off the ground, but the relevant branches that they will be on is providing their body with support. A snake which is well supported is invariably a snake which isn't going to give you too much in the way of drama. So we want to try and keep a snake like this as much of it on the ground as possible. Okay? So what we don't want to be doing, you know, only do what you have to do. We spoke about it previously, when you're handling venomous snakes, when you're handling any snake, only do what you need to do. If you don't bring, if you don't need to bring a snake off the ground, leave it where it is. Okay? If you are handling a larger cobra species or any kind of a lapid off the ground, like so, you know, if you get into trouble with a large snake like this, your 
your brain, your brain is going to basically, you're going to want to drop that snake, okay? Your, your brain's going to tell you, this is a dangerous situation, I need to drop this snake and get out of here, okay? Your brain will tell you one thing, but dropping the snake from mid-air feels very, very unnatural, okay? So your brain will tell you one thing, but your hands will tell you another. Your brain will tell you drop, your hands will say put down. You have not got that time, okay? So whenever you're using a snake on a hook, we want to try and keep the actual contact with the snake itself as unbroken as possible, okay? Ideally letting the snake run through the hook at all times, okay? With many a lapid species, a lot of snake predators will come from above, okay? So what we don't want to be doing, we don't want to find ourselves bending over a snake which is on the ground, which may elicit a defensive response, okay? So we always want to keep ourselves offset from the snake. We want to try and keep our potential target area of our body as small as possible. So when you see me handling snakes with my left arm behind my back, it's not because I'm terribly posh, it's because it's just doing nothing at this particular point. It's just another part of my body which is the potential side to take a bite. Okay? So introducing the snake, the hook underneath the snake's head, unbroken hook contact throughout the snake's body. Try to remain, keep a straight back and bringing that snake to your hand, your tail section on, and then you can move the snake around as you need to, okay? If you find yourself in a situation where a snake is defensive, is challenging you, a potentially dangerous situation, all you should really be having to worry about is getting yourself at the handling environment, dropping that snake and moving away from it. If that snake is in mid-air, you've got to try and get that snake under control to begin with. It's very, very hard to stop a snake and a hook from mid-air. Even though that snake is challenging us and is providing us with a very dangerous situation, we don't want to do bad by that animal. It feels very, very unnatural. We're going to want to get that animal on the ground as soon as possible. And to be fair, you just haven't got that time. So from a handling perspective, you know, we need to make sure that we are keeping our eyes on the snake at all times, which means we need to employ a lot of our other senses. And one of the greatest senses we have is our sense of touch. If we are handling an animal for an extended period of time, and I'm talking minutes now, yeah, then we need to ensure that we've got as much of the snake on the ground as possible. If you've got the tail section on we spoke about earlier, and you're down on one knee but never two, you should be able to feel the ground underneath your knuckles. You don't need to keep looking at that tail hand, your eyes should be on that snake's head. You know that you cannot get any more of that snake on the ground as possible because you can feel the ground underneath your knuckles. So very, very basic cook training that is really. We also spoke about protection <coughs> versus control and the relationship between the two. Now, in terms of protection and control, if we're using one hook and we're basically bringing our hand into the equation. Physical contact with that animal is basically putting ourselves at a closer range and potentially endangering ourselves. Now, I have got a rattlesnake tail around here somewhere. Owing to the delicate tail structures on rattlesnakes, if I was to be single hooking and tailing, I couldn't take it from the rattle, it's just too weak. Okay, so we need to move our hand a little bit further down the snake's body, potentially, you know, further towards the head, and we are endangering ourselves. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, I don't believe that the single hook and tailing of rattlesnakes is the safest way of handling them. And I prefer to use a twin hooking technique, where a hook in both hands with no hand contact whatsoever. That's a pretty obvious example. Now, when we are moving, if you imagine a rattlesnake, and I know you can all mentally picture it, if we're moving away from the rattle, we are, our protection versus control, we are giving up protection to gain control. We are moving our hand closer towards the animal's head to gain greater control. Let's not even employ our hand, let's not even take a physical contact with that snake. Let's use two hooks to handle that animal with. Okay, so the use of two hooks is easy enough. Rattlesnakes twin hook really, really nicely. Um, I wouldn't take any adult baboon vipers, puff adders, or the likes off on hooks this fine, but again, it's another really good example. A heavily bodied snake, they tend to have very, very small tails, even with the males. It's not offering that snake a great deal of support on a single hook. So actually, let's keep our hands out of the way, let's keep ourselves safe, and we're going to make sure that this animal is supported roughly at thirds along its length over two hooks, okay? Now, there is another group of snakes, not a particular genus or particular set of species, but there's a, uh, 
a group of snakes which you could probably categorise by lifestyle, and they are snakes which are deemed to be caudal luring. Now, caudal luring, who can explain to me what caudal luring is? I will be selected in terms of who I take the answer from. Uh, caudal luring, who can talk to me about caudal luring? Tail wiggles. Tail wiggles, yeah, and why do they do that? Yeah. It's, um, there are some fantastic examples amongst the venomous species, but caudal luring, when we talk about it, we talk about it in a sense that, oh, it's only venomous snakes that do it. You know, this is a real specialised behaviour. Reticulated pythons will caudal lure. You know, green tree pythons are a great example. Caudal luring species are species of snake, um, or species of snake which exhibit these behaviours. They actually go fishing for their dinner. They tend to be like ambush predators, but what they'll be doing is, and again, there are some fantastic examples. Spider tail vipers are, are, are a great one, where these animals will often rest up in leaf litter or in vegetation, in foliage, and they will wriggle their tails. And the tails will normally be a different colour to the actual body itself. And this caudal luring activity will also, um, generally, the whole aim of it is that it entices um, potential prey items within striking distance. So you may have um, a deaf adder, is a great example, in leaf litter, wriggling its tail around. It will look very, very enticing to a bird, a small mammal, a lizard or a frog. Um, and when that potential prey item is in striking distance, then they'll be bitten and envenomated. So by, by lifestyle, there's a massive body of snakes out there, which if you decide, they may look like a cobra, they may look long and thin, okay? So there may be, copperheads are a good example, let's take a single hook, okay, and let's pick it up by its tail. If you're touching that snake's tail, you are ringing the dinner bell, okay? You are asking to get bitten, okay? And although I don't really want to talk about dry bites too much, if you're getting a predatory reaction from a snake like that, you're going to be getting a wet bite. Now, I know none of you guys here have ever lost a snake in the house, have you? No one's ever had a snake get out, have they? <laughs> none of you. Yeah. Absolutely none of you. You never found that snake in the middle of the room, did you? You generally will find a snake in an extremity, or they'll be following a floor to wall junction, the furthest part from the middle of the room. So, I'm a real fan of restraining tubes, okay? I hate the term restraining. Uh, it sounds an awful lot worse than it is. Snakes will often naturally seek out small, tight hiding spaces, and I can't really do it in this particular room, but if you wanted to, it's a situation, we're going to try and park up jiggers and pinners, but if you wanted to get a venomous snake into your bare hands, okay, with no other form of equipment, you know, there's going to be a kind of time where you may have to remove an eye cap and you can't do it using a tube. Um, if we need to get a snake into our hands, and we don't want to use a jigger like this, then restraining tubes can be a great choice. So let's just see if we can take this out of the Now, it's actually, it's actually providing the snake with some form of support inside that tube. Um, they're not particularly invasive, there's no real pressure upon the snake. Remember we spoke about physics and how our bodies work. Um, if you guys can see there, just you've got a forefinger and thumb for the tube and three fingers for the snake. Okay, this I'm joined by Julia. Thank you for coming. First question, and second three questions. One for the Fantastic. Absolutely loved it. It's great to get back amongst like-minded keepers of all ages and all experience levels. A very, very friendly atmosphere. I, I'd recommend it to anybody um, who's keen to learn, but also people that have learned, had a degree of experience, and want to share it with newer keepers. So it's a fantastic thing. I think that's important because um, a lot of newer keepers might feel that they wouldn't be, uh, without some experience, they wouldn't be as accepted. Yeah. And obviously, you know, the old keeper with more experience, experience can give them that. We have always been, nobody wakes up an expert, nobody wakes up with loads and loads of experience. We've always, we've been that keeper, I've been that keeper with their first corn snake, their first neck of gecko. Um, just because I'm keeping at a, a slightly more advanced level in my hobby, it doesn't mean I forget where I've come from, you know, how, where I was 10 years ago, where I was 30 years ago. So, and I think the learning never stops. The minute you think, I know it all, I know everything there is to know about it, you're kidding yourself. As far as I'm concerned, every day is a school day. Yeah. You always learn. Always it learn. never stops. And how do you get into keeping animals to begin with? 
That looks like it's a short, short question. question. Yeah, long answer probably. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, I think at some point, most kids, as, as younger children, are being, so, are being a kid down a duck pond collecting tadpoles. Some children will move on into other things, be it break dancing, BMX, skateboarding, whatever it is kids were into at that particular time. And myself, I was never that child, I never moved, really moved away from the tadpole bucket. Yeah. Um, it was something which really ignited the spark in me, and I've always maintained that passion, not just for reptiles and amphibians, but for, but for all animals. Yeah. So, some kids, they always pretty much start with that appreciation for wildlife and tadpoles and the likes of, but a lot of children tend to leave it alone and move away from it, but I've just stuck with it. And still, you know, now at 47, I'm still that kid with yeah. the tadpoles. You have to so get born here with the same as very well. Much. And that's why it's great to turn up something like this, because everyone's coming from the same kind of place. Yeah. You know, everyone's got a slightly different degree of experience, but all those experiences are different. And if, if they get shared, then, you know, that's where the hobby really gets taken forward. And ultimately, our animals are kept better for. So there are, there are no negatives to it, it can only be a positive thing, but I think it's important to, that experienced keepers remember that they have been that person, they have been that new keeper, yeah. and it's really important to stay grounded and remember where you came from, you know. Absolutely. Nobody knows I mean, I heard you mention um, during your, your lecture about the, uh, the people on the keyboards, yeah. basically. Yeah. How did you find the ability to benefit those it's, um, I think a lot of people need to do it. I think an awful lot of people hide behind their keyboards. I think if people conducted themselves as a society like this in a face-to-face -face type meet, um, the way they do behind their keyboards, I think they'd meet for a very, very kind of rude comeuppance. And I, I just do, I don't feel, if you, you wouldn't conduct yourself, you wouldn't conduct yourself in a face-to-face -face type manner, why would you do it behind, and what does it say about you? It says much more about you as a person than a lot more than what you're actually saying, yeah. you know, so people will actually forget the comment, it might be something very constructive, but if it's been delivered in a rude manner, yeah. then actually people stop seeing the content and looking at the person and really, they'll make their own judgments, yeah. you know, and it's very, very hard to undo that, so I believe as much as technology and the internet is a fantastic thing, I don't think we always use it particularly well, and I think there'll always be um, a need for face-to-face, -face, you know, old school clubs like this, it, it's healthy, it's like yeah. and it's a very, very much, it's a social thing, it's getting to keep it together for a few beers, and the, the, the information flow, and the information exchange is very, very fluid, you know, you can learn as much out of the bar, having a drink with somebody about what they're keeping, you know, and it might be a very, very small element of the keeping of that species, but it might be really important to you, you might just think you haven't fell on the internet, haven't been able to read a book, and you pick it up and meet like this with very, very like minded people. So it's very, very healthy socially, but also people's animals benefit. We all really want that. So yeah. fantastic. Okay, one very, very final question. I said sort of three questions, sorry. Um, one, one piece of advice for new keepers of any exotic animals, what would you give them? You will ultimately learn more from your animals than you will do from anybody on the internet or other keepers. Dismissing those sources. If you want to learn about your animals, spend time with them. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoyed the Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.